culture shifters. I, I love preaching on culture because let me tell you why. Um, those of you who haven't heard me minister before, just relax. It's all right. My husband is the pastor of, his, of this church with me. I serve alongside him and, and underneath and the whole thing, all right? So we're in order. Just relax. Um, but, but, uh, all right, you, you'll figure it out by the end, it's okay. So anyway, just thinking about uh, w- what an opportunity to speak about what a Christian looks like right now in a time when the world is trying to define it or redefine it, where the devil's trying to, trying to grab it. For us to, to actually say, this is what a Christian looks like, this is what healthy church looks like, this is who Jesus is. Uh, because my life, I am the recipient of being raised in a healthy Christian culture. The great mum and dad who raised me in the house of God in a healthy church, they loved me and they loved one another. And as a result, I get to live a life with probably a lot less baggage than most people. No, no credit to myself, but credit to the culture I was raised in. So I'm not saying that to brag or to condemn, but to say what a privilege and opportunity we have to to those who have been given much, receive much, let them also give, let them also pay it forward. So what we're going to do is we're going to create here in San Diego a Christian culture. We're going to shift the culture. We're not going to let the enemy and the powers of wickedness, the principalities and powers, have their hands on the dial or the atmosphere of what our city looks like, culture shifters. So I was thinking about Elijah. Now, Elijah is a prophet in the Old Testament. We're going to hear about his story in the book of 1 Kings, but he was a boss. He's one of only a few people that never saw death. God told him, you know what, I'm going to take you up now. But, But like the rest of these earthlings, you are actually not going to die breathe your last and wait in the ground till the resurrection. I'm going to take you up VIP status. Uh, I'm going to send some fiery chariots, some chariots of fire. Remember that song? It was about Elijah. So I'm going to bring, I'm going to come down and and angels are going to descend in a chariot of fire and we're going to take you up to heaven. Big roller style. So this is Elijah's story. But Elijah, like you and I, was immersed in a culture that was terribly ungodly. Completely corrupt, completely perverted, much like today. And his biggest foe and enemy at the time was a king named Ahab, who was a weak man with a very wicked and corrupt wife by the name of Jezebel. And so they had created a culture of idolatry and perversion. Control, manipulation, and perversion. Sound familiar? So, so we're here right now, and if, and if I could say anything to you right now, it's that In America right now, the prevailing spirit that the church is warfaring against, now we know we win, but we are going to wage some battles because there's still a fight for the souls of men, is the Jezebel spirit. Now, now what is that in like common man speak? Control, manipulation, perversion, and confusion. So, So look around. So look around, look around the world. And we've got, we've got a nice bubble here at Awaken Church. But when you go outside, the world is, they're like sheep without a shepherd, confused, hapless, helpless, overwhelmed, and struggling. So that's why God wants us to shift the culture. Somebody say shift the culture, shift the culture. So we're going to talk about the spirit of Elijah today. But I want to start by... Uh, just sharing with you some of the words of our Savior Jesus here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. He gathered his disciples around. He got the church together and he said this, Behold, I am sending you, somebody say me, out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. What's Jesus saying here? I want to prepare you for how to live well and in an, in an environment that is hostile to God. I want you to keep your innocence. I want you to keep your heart soft. Keep your heart soft toward people. Keep your heart soft toward God. But I want you to be awake. I want you to be aware of the schemes and the plans of the enemy. And if I had any 
I'm not even going to call it a criticism. If, if I had any observation, it's that the church, while it's tried to keep its innocence, has lost its awareness, its awakeness. So we've been naive to the schemes of the devil, and before you know it, the world's changed. How have re we regressed so much in history that we are facing the unique issues in the world that we're facing today, with the perversions and the problems that we're facing today. It's because the church was innocent, but the church wasn't aware. The church wasn't awake. That's why Jesus said, I want you to be wise as serpents and innocence, innocent as doves. So we have to be prepared as sons and daughters of God to live in a world that is hostile to Christ. Now, this is the time that Elijah found himself in. People were idol worshippers. They weren't following God's ways. It was a mess up in there. And then here's what happened. Elijah had a conversation with the king at the time, Ahab, who was a wicked king. Here's what happened. It says this in 1 Kings 18. It says, then it happened when Ahab, the wicked king, saw Elijah, the boss prophet of God, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? What? Talk about some major projection going on. Now, if I can make another observation, this is happening in our day where the wicked powers that be want to project their troubling ways onto the church. Oh, those Christians. It's the church. And you know what? Because we've kind of overreached in the mercy area, many of us are like, oh, what? Well, please tell us, all corrupt world, how we can be better. How we can share the message more succinctly. How we won't be offensive. And in their mind is that we just silence you altogether. But please... But what I love about Elijah was he was no apologist. He's like, he gets his finger and he points it right back at the devil, right back at the wicked king Ahab and says, it is not me that has troubled Israel, but you and your father's house. It is not us, Supervisor Fletcher, who has troubled San Diego. Oh, that awakened church opening their doors. They're still having church. They're still, still preaching the God. It's dangerous, you're troubler. Oh, it is not us who are troubling San Diego, but you and your lockdowns that have resulted in a spike in depression, a spike in suicide, a spike in divorce, a spike in mental illness and all kinds of things. It is not us who have troubled Israel, but you. It's time for the church to get their moxie back. So, what does the Bible tell us in the book of Ephesians, a warfare chapter? When having done all to stand, stand therefore. Now listen, you don't need to stand and be mean. But we need you to be confident and bold because you are full of the Spirit of God. The Bible says that the righteous are as bold as a lion. We've got to stop letting the world and the corrupt people define who we are. You don't get the microphone anymore, friends. That's what we've got to say now. You don't get the microphone. See, you look at what's happened. You look at most Hollywood movies. Let's break it down. Most Hollywood movies, you get two possible options of what a Christian looks like. Number one, he's a weakling. He doesn't have a backbone. Got no sense of humor either. Shares a brain cell with his wife. I just stumble through life and have cups of coffee with old ladies, and they don't have an opinion. They're just there. They give you a casserole in your darkest day and say, there, 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 there. So we get that Christian option number one. Spineless, weakling, without an opinion, weighs about 100 pounds, soaking wet, wears the same suit everywhere and rides a bike through town. Okay, so option one. Or option two, he's a crooked bigoted, shocking racist, hates gays. He's full of hate and he's mean and he's spiteful and he's got some hidden vice. Before the end of the movie, you're going to find out what it is. Two options. Hateful, mean, bigoted, shocking, weak, passive, simp. Okay, so... 
I hope that's not a bad word. It's not, is it? Good. It means like weak. It's a Gen Z word. I'm trying to be relevant. <laughs> so, so if we don't define what a Christian looks like, if we actually don't push back and actually absorb, who are we and why are we here? Because Jesus told us in the book of Matthew chapter 5, you are the light of the world. You are the salt of the... There's, there's, there's something about both light and salt. You can't ignore them, and they're not invisible. If salt turns up, you know about it. Now, we're not to be salt that stings, but we are meant to be the flavor. You're meant to know when we're there. We are not passive. We are on the dining table at every restaurant to add flavor where there are... Is no flavor. We are the light of the world. So when people are walking in darkness, hello, we're not going to let the, defi- the world define us or Hollywood define us as corrupt, mean, hard-hearted, but also not as weak, spineless weaklings. We are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. It is not us who have troubled Israel, but you and your father's house. I love this. So many people apologizing for the church. Listen, I'm not saying that some people in the church have not made mistakes at times. Of course they have. But the church is the greatest liberator. My gosh, the greatest liberator on planet Earth, the greatest restorer of families and broken hearts. Let's no longer let the world define who the church and what a Christian is. Amen. Amen. That was a good word. And we've got feminist groups coming after the church. Oh, the church, they. (laughs) The church is the greatest liberator of women. Jesus came and he showed us, he came to reveal the Father. And uh, there are many times in Scripture that Jesus comes and he liberates and restores and more than even restoring, shows the worth of every human, man, woman, child. The church, the Christian, is the greatest liberator. We've got feminist movements coming after us. But meanwhile, the irony, silent on what's happening in the Middle East. Oh, we'll criticize the church all day long. Where are you on the Middle East? They, They can't even show their hair. And you want to criticize and define the church as oppressive. My gosh. Somebody say, we got to get the microphone back. we got to get the microphone back. All right. So Elijah, he knew who he was and he knew why he was there. And there, were, there are situations and circumstances in our world right now where we are bowing our knee to things when God wants us to stand up straight. It's not us who have troubled Israel. We come in the name of the Lord, come to do good. We have come to help. We have come to care by you and your father's house. Somebody say it's time to shift the culture. It's time to shift the culture. The second thing that I want to talk about is this. It says here in 1 Kings 18, chapter 21, that Elijah stood in front of the people. So he got everybody together. He got the whole town together. I like him. Because he was a lone voice in his time. Sometimes it was very, very lonely for Elijah. He was in a culture that, as I said, was very hostile to God. They had embraced all kinds of idol worship. And he stood in front of them and he said this. He said, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, then follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. But the people were completely silent. The second thing that happens when someone stands up in the spirit of Jesus Christ, in the way that Elijah stood up with the spirit of courage, is that they live with complete devotion to Christ. Complete devotion to Christ. So at that particular time in Israel, Because Ahab, who was of the Israeli people, who was God's people, married a woman from a place called Sidon. Now, it matters who you marry, everybody. He married this woman, Jezebel, from Sidon. Now, she came from a lineage of idol worship. 
So instead of him being the influencer, she, he was influenced. So Jezebel comes in and then she introduces idol worship into Israel. But here's the, here's the, here's the funny thing. They didn't stop worshiping God. They just added other gods. They just lived in compromise. So they worshiped God and the Baals. And so that's why Elijah had to stand up and say, hey, 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 we're not doing this fair weather friend thing. We're not doing this lukewarm thing anymore. If God is God, then worship him. But if Baal is God, then worship him. But at that time, the Israeli people, they were in temple, they were in church on Sunday, putting in their offerings, singing their praises. And then Sunday night, they're out there sleeping with their boyfriends. And then Saturday night, they're at the clubs, mm, 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 sing. <laughs> and they're, they're, they're back in church on Sunday, and then they're twerking their way through the week. And, and Elijah had to call it out. Guys, how long are we going to live like this? And it's biblical because Jesus spoke, it, spoke about it in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we hear the revelation of Jesus Christ. So right throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus came to reveal, he, to show us who God is. This is who the Father is because the Pharisees have done a terrible job. No, this is who he is. This is what he looks like. But in Revelation, we get to see Jesus. We get to see the Jesus side. It's like, you know, and Jesus was, oh my gosh, shut the gate. He came out and he said, oh, I wish that you were either hot or cold. But do not be lukewarm. Because if you're lukewarm, I can't hang with you. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. And right now, I believe that we're in a season, although it is hostile to God, that God is pouring out a spirit like that which fell on Elijah. Just like the book of Malachi tells us, in the last days, the prophet Elijah will come and he will prepare the people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe that spirit is falling on the church right now, that spirit of Elijah, that culture shifting, shifting spirit that says, I will not live in compromise anymore. And you know why? It's not about rules and obligations. It's about being a witness, about the power of a transformed life. Paul said this in the book of Corinthians. He said, you used to be adulterers, prostitutes, cheats, fornicators, ungrateful, unholy, but you were cleansed. You were made right in relationship by the Spirit of the Lord. You are not that way anymore. Can I encourage you today? Let that same spirit that Elijah brought in his generation be one that you carry. Be one where I don't live in compromise. And you might find even coming to Awaken Church because we, we have a really free, we're free and we're liberated. And we're not going to give you a whole bunch of rules. We're not, not going to say you can't wear spaghetti straps <laughs> and, and you have to hug everybody sideways. <laughs> and and you've got to sign a, a, a disclaimer that you will not drink. But at the same time, please do not take our freedom and our liberty, which is God's gift, as a license to sin. Live your life wholly and completely for God. I have zero regrets in living my life wholly and completely for God. Don't be, don't be ashamed to walk the narrow path. We don't have to walk it and be judgmental. We don't want to walk it and be condemning. But we want to walk along the narrow path because it's the pathway that leads to life. So we can show a hurting world around us who has not been taught well, who has not been raised in some of the homes that we were privileged enough to be raised in, that when we walk in the ways of the Lord, our life is blessed. The Bible says the way of life winds upward for the righteous. So Elijah came carrying this culture-shifting spirit, and he called the people out. He called them to the carpet. How long are you going to falter between two opinions? I found that in 2020, it was the great revealer and the great sifter. When people didn't have to come to church, woo, happy as little clams. And when we found the church doors open again, half of them were missing. But you know what I've realized? God's really, really pleased to be able to speak to a field that is ripe. And a lot of us turn ourselves inside out to get 
the word to people who are actually still not ready to hear it? And, we, and, and how can I, and what can I? But Jesus said, he said, look at the fields. They are ripe unto harvest. And you'll find that there is a message that is ready to be heard by the ears of the ripe. Not everybody wants God. I, I know you're not going to hear that a lot in church. I, I wish it wasn't so. It's not God's will. It's not God's will that anyone should perish, but all should have everlasting life. However, there are some people that don't want the Lord. Preach to the ripe. Preach to those who have ears ready to hear. Teach me how to live. And we have so watered down our message and tried to make the gospel diet coke, just one calorie. And we've done a bait and switch. And then people come to church and then they find out what the Christian faith really said. What? Preach to the ripe. Preach to the ripe. The word of God will change your life. We live with complete devotion to Christ. Galatians 5.13 says, this is Paul speaking. For you've been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. We live with complete devotion to Christ. We're called to be culture shifters. We shift the culture, not through our compromise, not through our doing one thing on a Sunday and another thing on a Monday, but by being fully and committed and devoted to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Amen. The next thought I want to bring is this. If you look at the story of of Jezebel and Elijah and Ahab, and I, I really want to encourage you, what I want to do here is just whet your appetite for your own Bible study. We're, we don't want you to just survive on a Christian RX bar and never actually know what it is to have four square meals a day, okay, or three, depending on how hungry you are, I suppose. <laughs> so, so I want you to, this is your assignment. This is your homework when you go home. I want you to read the book of First Kings. I want you to read about Elijah because that is the spirit that God is needing us to rise and occupy right now and stand in. But we see Jezebel, and Jezebel was obsessed with getting territory, with owning land. And Jesus said it. He said, the sons of darkness are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Because Jezebel knew that territory was influence. Territory was power. That's why Bill Gates is buying up half the Midwest, all right, because he's a smart man. He may not be a good man, but he's a smart man. So here's what happens. Ahab looks next door. And he sees a field, and it's a stunning piece of land, a territory, owned by a neighbor, a vineyard. He's like, oh, I'd I'd, I'd quite fancy that. So he goes over, and he talks to Naboth, and he's like, please sell me your land, Naboth. And Naboth's like, I'm not selling you my land. This land is my father's inheritance to me. It's a word for the church. And then Ahab's like, humph, because he's a weakling. So he just goes home and he collapses on his chase lounge. And in walks his wife, stomping in, wearing leather and snakeskin. And she's like, what's wrong with you? He's like, I went to Nabal's house and I wanted to buy his land and I offered to pay him full price and he wouldn't sell it to me. And Jezebel's like, oh, no, he didn't. Leave it to me. And then she comes up with a plan. So she concocts a scheme where they are going to slander and lie about Naboth, say that he was a blasphemer so he would be stoned to death. So that's exactly what she did. They accused him of being a blasphemer and then they put him in front of the court. They got three wicked men, three liars, the Bible says, to a minute, yes, I saw it. And before you know it, he was condemned and he was dead, stoned to death. And then Jezebel walks in wearing her dragon skin. And here's Ahab lying on the chase lounge watching the real housewives of the Old Testament. (laughs) And she gets the deed to the vineyard and she slops it down on him and said, here, the land now belongs to you. That spirit is still at work in the earth today. Where the enemy has been more relentless in gaining territory than the sons of God have been. But I believe the culture is shifting and the power is shifting that the sons and daughters are awakening in their mandate. 
their assignment and they're going to say, you cannot have that which belongs to my father. That is my father's inheritance. So here's the point. Here's the point I want to make. And it may hurt a little bit more than the last one. We are called to fund the work of the Lord. Have you noticed that the works of evil are are well-funded, well-organized, well-resourced? So even in the last in, in the last budget, six hundred and sixty-one million dollars, your your tax money, was given to fund Planned Parenthood. Evil is well funded. We gave six hundred and sixty-one million, may as well have been six hundred and sixty-six million dollars to Planned Parenthood, which is responsible for the greatest genocide. 60 million lives and counting on U.S. soil since its inception in 1973, since Roe v. Wade became a thing. And then we wonder why we have a generation of young people, like we saw not too long ago, where two teenage girls killed an Uber driver and once they saw his dead body lying crumpled next to them, cared more about getting their cell phone back than they did that they'd taken the life of someone's daddy. This is the collateral of the abortion generation where there is no value for human life. So we think, oh, what does it matter? They're just tiny little embryos. Oh, my gosh. Before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Image bearers of Christ. And we wonder why there's no sanctity and regard for human life afterwards because we haven't established it from the beginning. No life will matter until womb lives matter. That deserves more of an amen. So we find we, we can't complain about it because the works of evil are well funded. They're well funded. There's, drug dealers are well funded. Cartels are well funded. You've seen their mansions. And they're, they're, they're ns, ns, ns cars. They're yachts with the, the chopper pads on them. They, they're, they're well resourced. They're well, well dialed in. But the work of God, there are some churches, not ours, but the pastor has to turn himself inside out to convince the church to tithe. And they're still squabbling over whether tithing and giving is Old Testament or New Testament. It's, it's in both. Jesus spoke about tithing in the New Testament. But so many of us, because unfortunately we haven't read the Bible, we go off the sound bites of those who have been critical and wounded and have decided they want to rewrite the scriptures according to their own preference. But I love this because the spirit of Elijah right here shows us that the Lord will have his work funded. So, so it's, a, it's a famine. They're in a famine. They're in a drought because Elijah had said, basically, there's going to be no rain until at my word. Now, this was a man of God. He was a boss. And he said, drought, no rain until I say there's going to be rain. And, and it happened. Your words are powerful. But even in the midst of this drought and this famine, the Bible says that Jezebel, oh, she was able to eat. She had food, so much food that she was able to feed the prophets of Baal and Asherah from her very table. The works of evil are well-funded. But how amazing is God in the midst of that where the enemy has been well-resourced, he uses a widow to provide for the word of God. Not only a widow, but a man by the name of Obadiah who was a servant in Ahab's house. He was royal himself. The Bible says that even though he served a wicked king, he had a heart for God. And so when Jezebel was trying to kill all the prophets of God, she got a whole bunch of them, put them in a cave. He got a whole bunch of them, put them in a cave and fed them out of his own pocket. This tells me that there's a principle at play from those in the palace who fear God and honor God and want his work reverenced and his voice to be heard, his voice to be supreme in the land, to even the widow who is impoverished herself. God is saying, I want every person to be part of funding my work in this time, in this generation. And how good is God? He says, if you stretch out your hand and you feed the prophet, you feed the word of God so the word of the Lord can ring clear like a clarion sound, in the midst of the noise of the false prophets, I will make sure that not only is that word going forth, but your house is blessed. 
That's why in Malachi 3.10 it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. God wants food in his house. He wants it so Awakened Church can can care for and oversee five orphanages in Mexico so we can put on the most epic productions like Hero and Twisted and see multitudes saved. So when the public school system goes down the toilet, we can say, you know what, we're going to start our own school. We're going to start Awaken Academy. And we're going to teach people that they've been created in the image of God. They're not some cosmic accident. We're not going to teach them evolution. We're going to teach them that they were fashioned by God with a divine purpose and intent. We're going to teach them in the ways of the Lord. That's why I'm so proud of my husband for buying land. So don't criticize him. Pray for him. Pray for him. Because we're not building a monument to ourselves. We're building a legacy for generations to come. So when they decide they're going to have the next pandemic and they want to shut the doors of the church, you know what? We're not renters, we're owners. I'm sorry, what name is this on the top? All over America. So wherever you go, you can find a life-giving house of God where lives can be restored, where people can find their purpose and destiny, where they can find salvation, where they can be discipled, where people can meet each other and get married and create a culture that shifts and create a culture that breeds some of the most incredible people to stand on God's green earth. I'm just determined. I'm not going to stand in the land that I pledged allegiance to and let the devil overthrow the church and let the devil be more passionate and more determined to fund the works of evil than we are to fund the work of the Lord. Can somebody say a huge amen? Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Amen, Leanne. Well done, Pastor Yerkes. We fund the work of the Lord. And then finally... The last point I want to make on the spirit of Elijah, culture shifters. What does a Christian look like? We are awake, but we are not woke. 1 Kings 18, 19 says this. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. This is Elijah speaking. He's getting everybody together. They're going to have a showdown. And and when you read this, when you go home and read this story, you're going to see what happens. So he was one of, he was a lone voice. He was a lone voice. He was outmatched in every way. But he got everybody together, and they were going to have a showdown and see which God was Lord. Was it Baal or was it God? And whoever's God was real was going to answer by fire. And you know what happened? Exactly that. The Bible says that all the prophets of Baal, they tried as they might to get their God to answer by fire. Nothing happened. They were cutting themselves. They were turning themselves inside out. No answer. But then Elijah turns up. He pours water on the sacrifice. He makes it even harder. You know what? I'm going to double down. He had so much comfort, confidence in his God. And then amazingly, he calls and then fire comes down from heaven. And there is just no, there is no stopping it. There is no denying it. God is the Lord. But it says here in this scripture, 1 Kings 18, 19, he says, I want you to bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So I want to just take a second to talk about that point. So Jezebel wasn't, she wasn't start trying to stop the prophetic. She was just wanting to control it. She had prophets eating at her table. She didn't want the prophet of the Lord speaking. She wanted to take Elijah's head, but she was happy to have the fake news prophets and feed them, control them, because Jezebel wants to control the narrative. She wants to control how words are defined. She wants to control what the world hears. So she's like, I'm going to buy you. And here's the thing about a true believer, a Christian. We cannot be bought. We cannot be bought. We will not compromise the gospel. We will not compromise the truth. We will speak as the Lord speaks, and we will amen only that which the Lord has spoken. But she bought them. They're eating from her table. And I want to talk about that because I feel very strongly in my spirit, I know this is the Lord, that the Lord wants us to get the microphone back. 
The time of passive Christianity is over. We don't need to be aggressive, but we need to be assertive. We need to stand therefore, because there is literally a generation hanging in the balance. Look around at the confusion. We've let the prophets of Baal have the microphone. The future is female. And many sectors of the church, they, they bought it. They bought into it and they're all wearing it at their conferences and rocking on and singing hell and ready. I am woman, hear me wrong. And look, I'm all for women's liberation and men's liberation and the generational liberation. Jesus was a liberator, no denying it. But then we let the false prophets prophesy the future is female. And then I'm at the mall the other day. Why do all the men look like women? What? A, what, what? And we don't understand whoever prophesies, whoever controls the narrative, whoever's bought, gets the power of the air. And your speech, my speech, was always laced with creativity. So we just let them. And the church pandered to it. The future is female. Well, I had some shirts made. The future is male and female. Let's get it right, y'all. Because the church needs to get the microphone back and we need to stop curtailing and letting the world tell us we're the troubler when we are the fixer, we're the helper, we're the restorer. So I was at the mall, I'm like, I honestly had that revelation. I'm watching men walk around in shorts that a man should not be wearing. <laughs> there is more pink in the men's section than the girls' section at this point. I look up, I mean, I'm just calling it how it is. And we thought we could broadcast the future is female and it not have any effect. And the collateral damage is a generation of young men who don't know who they are. We've got to get the microphone back. We've got to prophesy again in the name of the Lord. We've got to let the redeemed of the Lord say so and not allow the loudest voice. We don't have to be the majority, but we have to be the loudest voice. Elijah wasn't the majority, but he had the loudest voice. It is time to disrupt the enemy's airwaves. So they want to define words. Jezebel, she'll feed, she'll feed, she'll well re resource the prophets of, of Baal at her table because she wants to control what they say. If you can control what the prophets are saying, you can control how the people think. This is why I want you to read this at home. You look at what they've what they've done with words that belong to us. Symbols that have belong to us. We've got the world trying to tell us what love is. But no. I'm sorry. Your broken, dysfunctional self does not get to tell me what love is. We're going to turn the tables around on that. And then they'll come back at you and say, oh, but God is love. God is love. Yes. No, nobody said he wasn't. Nobody has ever... For God so loved the world. God so God is love. But they're trying to redefine what love is. How, how many people here have children? Lots of you. How many people love their children? Excellent. Just as many hands. Good. How many people accept everything their children do? Accept all their behavior? How many people tolerate everything your kids do? How many people, how many people agree with everything your children do? And yet the world has tried to redefine love in a way that we have to agree with everything, approve with everything, and tolerate everything. But they don't, they don't get to define the word. The church has to get the dictionary back. It's time for the church to get the dictionary back and stop letting the world define what the church and the love of God was only meant to de define. So here's the Bible right here. This is a book of love. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, it's the chapter of love. It tells us what love is like. And do you know what it says at the end? Love does not rejoice in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. We've got to get the microphone back. Or what about this word, the word tolerance? tolerance but what they mean when they say tolerance is well, we're not going to tolerate you but you got to tolerate us we're not going to tolerate the Christians so so when it comes to education um, yeah we're going to kick prayer out of school in 1962 we're going to kick it out we're going to watch education go down the toilet um, yeah because we're not going to tolerate you but you got to tolerate us 
So we're going to bring in the HR 5, the Equality Act, which isn't equality, which is about me tolerating you, but you, not you tolerating me. So I have to tolerate the fact that now I've lost my right to have my 12-year-old daughter go into a change room and not have to share it with somebody who feels like they may be her same sex that day. Okay. Now, you may think I'm being mean, but I'm not. I have a lot of experience. I've been a youth pastor before I was a senior pastor for 14 years. In that 14 years, in one particular town that Pastor Jürgen and I pastored in, 85% of the young people we ministered to and pastored were sexually assaulted. Do you know where most of those assaults took place? Public restrooms, change rooms at athletics clubs, swimming carnivals, where the enemy snuck in. And we want to make it law and we want to make it legal under the guise of equality. And isn't that Jezebel? Oh, she was pretty on the outside. She was beautiful and that was the whole trick. She was pretty on the outside and a lot of this this, uh, virtue signaling we're hearing and a lot of these redefinitions of words like love and tolerance, oh, they sound good. They're seductive because, oh, well, I don't want to be intolerant. Oh, I don't want to be unloving. And a whole lot of woke but not awake Christians have been drinking the Kool-Aid because they don't know their Bible and they don't know the spirit of our God. And they don't know the difference between medicine that's going to heal and poison that's going to kill. Things have to shift. we got to get the microphone back. The culture is shifting. We are awake and we are not woke. What about the word judge? Don't judge. Do you know the most commonly rehearsed, repeated, and commonly known scripture by the world is this? Matthew 7, 14, I believe. Judge not, lest ye be judged. They don't know another lick of scripture, but they can quote that one as sure as the day is long. They know no Bible except for Matthew. They could, they could say that in their sleep, judge not. And so a whole lot of Christians, because we've believed when the devil is pointed, oh, you troubler of Israel. <gasps> what, us? No, well, how can I change? What can I do? What? It is not us who have troubled. A lot of Christians, so when it comes to words like judge, merely, oh, well, I can't judge. No, what you're saying is I don't think and I don't care. Because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 14, judge not lest ye be judged, talking about the value of a person. You are not to ever devalue or judge the intrinsic value of every human. That is God's business. But I'm to judge the behavior. I cannot decide whether you are evil or good. That is God's business. But I sure as heck am going to be judging that behavior. And if you're a smart person, if you're a discerning person, if you're a leader and not a follower, then you will judge behavior. That is good. That is bad. And every single one of us as parents should be doing that. There are some kids my kid can hang out. I'm going to make judgments based on behavior. We have a whole book of judges. We have a legal system. If someone's behavior is such and such, we put them before a right. And yet we've let the world define the dictionary term of what judging means. And so we've thrown out our discernment. Let me end with the scripture I started with. I am sending you out as sheep amongst wolves. Therefore, be awake. Be as wise as serpents, but innocent as doves. It's time for the church to be awake and not woke. I saw an album cover not too long ago, and it it concerned me, quite honestly. And I actually think this this fellow is dead. It said, only God can judge me. Only God can judge me. I remember looking at it. He looked like a handsome young man. I I thought, how sad. How sad that the only time you allow your life to come under any level of inspection is when you stand before a holy and almighty God on judgment day at the judgment seat. Heaven help us. Now, we've got to create a culture where we, re, we don't allow the world to define what judgment means, where we can actually come into a place and allow people who love us, not everybody, but godly people, people who care about you, who love you, who are godly, who are sound and who are righteous and virtuous, say, hey, there are some behaviors that you're engaging in. I'm judging the behavior. 
And I'm saying, that's not going to help you. Maybe this young man would still be alive had he let someone who loved him, a grandma, a pastor, a father, a brother come in and say, don't live like that. That's not going to end well for you. But we've let the world define the dictionary terms of words that only the church, the Bible, and our God should be defining. I'm telling you, the power is shifting. The power is shifting. The Bible tells us the last words in the book of Malachi before the New Testament started, that God would send the spirit of Elijah to prepare the people for the second coming of Christ. I believe right now the church, the prophets of God, those who carry the voice of God are coming out of their cave and they're going to start to stand in their full authority and station again. This world has need of your voice. We are salt. We are light. We are called to be culture shifters, not culture conformers. I'd love it if you'd stand to your feet. Now I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go home, and I want you to read that story, and I want, I want you to let the Lord speak to you. Let the Lord show you. Let the Lord open your eyes. The world doesn't need woke. It needs the Spirit of God. It needs to be awakened. The Bible says that the whole earth is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons and daughters of God. We have a spirit in this world right now, people in this world, people who are saying, will the real Christians please stand up and show us who you are? What does a real Christian look like? Do we conform to the culture? Do we let the world just go to hell in a handbasket during our time and season going, oh, well, we've read, we've read the end. We know we win in the end, but oh, what are you going to do in your time and your generation? You were put on planet Earth for this time and this hour, April 2021, for a reason. You've got the goods for right now. God knew exactly what he was doing when he positioned you on planet Earth for this time. Lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I thank you right now for a spirit of Elijah to fall upon your church. Father, where there was fear, I speak faith. Where there was intimidation, I speak courage. And I declare over you the words that God spoke to Joshua. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and very courageous. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Father, I thank you right now for courage and bravery and strength. And Father, for these people to be God seekers, not seekers of man's approval, but seekers of the smile of heaven. And Father, I thank you for divine appointments. Father God, for you to open up doors that no man can shut for us to preach the gospel, to stand firmly in our faith and be bold as a lion. In Jesus' mighty name, I thank you for the spirit of Elijah that falls like fire across this building right now. And every heart that is open to you, every ear that hears and every eye that sees. In Jesus' mighty name, and somebody shout amen. Thanks for listening. To find out more about our locations, team, and what we do here at Awakened Church, go to awakenchurch.com.